This is Don't Panic, episode number 14, recorded September 17th, 2013, on Kit Kat, bumping, and farm fresh to your door. Hello and welcome. It's another fantastic Tuesday evening, and that can mean only one thing. You've come here for tips on getting that pesky red wine stain out of your white linens. The tip is soda water and vinegar. But we'll talk about that later. First, we have to go over all the exciting tech news that's happening this week, and I can't think of a better place to do it than right here on Don't Panic on the Gadgets, Internet, and You. Joined as I'm Sean Jennings, joined as always by, let's start with Colby. How you doing, Colby? Glad to have you back. <laughs> Uh, thanks. I'm I'm excited to be back. I miss you guys last week. How was sunny Seattle? It was actually sunny. Wow. I, I, he brings yeah. the sunshine with him. Apparently, <laughs> this is this is how like Microsoft gets people to work there. Like they intern there during the summer and it's sunny, and then they come back and they they they're like, <laughs> gotcha. Got him. Plenty yeah. evil, just like Microsoft. Like every college in the Northeast ever. Yes. <laughs> and that is, of course, Dan Miller. Dan, how are we doing this week? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. This is uh, this is going to be a great show. Uh, but let's do some of the housekeeping stuff first. Uh, thanks to everyone listening live again for now. Tuesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern. Uh, online, of course, our website, don'tpanic.io. You can listen live there as well as uh, get in on all the good uh, recorded goodness. Uh, for audio and video episodes. And, of course, like us on Facebook, because uh, that's where all the cool stuff gets updated, facebook.com slash show. Tell your friends. Um, with that, we are going to get into today's big topic, and that would be Android. Now, last week, let's be honest, we talked about a company a little bit, just a tiny bit, Apple. I don't know if anyone was really interested in what we were saying, if that's, you know, whatever. That was last week, Okay. Mm -hmm. This week, we're going to move on to something a little different. We went from the healthy, the apple, right, the the, the good, the clean, the sharp, to delicious Android. (laughs) That's right. Uh, What was it? Uh, A couple weeks ago, Android finally announced the name and number, there you go, uh, of their next Android operating system. Uh, It was originally Key Lime Pie. They even used that name internally. And to the surprise of literally everybody, uh... The new uh, Android 4.4, the next version, KitKat. Woo! KitKat. Yay. Uh, guys, what do we uh, what do we think of the name? Is this a uh, is this a product placement gone wrong or a or a clever memorable title? And while you discuss that, I'm gonna break me off a piece of this uh, KitKat one. <laughs> yeah, go first because I want to start eating mine too. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Mm. I have a delicious Shiner beer beverage that none of you have. So. I'll trade. Mm, no, thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, it's not doesn't feel like over product placement, but you have to think like people, us, the people who are really into this. We knew the gingerbreads and the ice cream sandwiches and the froyos and the eclairs. Like we were up on that, but no one else cares. People care about Kit Kats with a little Android robot on the package. So I think it's a really good marketing move. I don't think it is at all Google being like, let's see how much money we can get by naming it after an actual candy. I think it's more like, let's see how much more recognition we can get from the fact that we're releasing a new version of Android because, you know, most people, I don't know if this is true, but it feels like most people who use Android aren't even using the real Android. So maybe this is also a way for them to like uh, advertise, show off what the real Android is. They'd be like, "Oh, what's this uh, KitKat Android thing all about?" Yeah, I I agree. Like, <laughs> it feels so. I think in general, I get pretty upset when things are named after like brands, like like. I think I think the most recent trend is like sports stadiums, right? Like there's AT and T Park here in San Francisco, or the Patriots Stadium is Gillette Stadium, when the old stadium used to be Foxborough Stadium. Um, and I think like I think we're gradually moving towards a world where everything is named after a brand, which is pretty unfortunate, if you ask me. Like I don't know. I think there will be a time when you buy like. Or I don't know if I think this will be the case, but, like, what if there's a time when you buy, like, 
I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I can't think of a good a good question now. Like, Smartphone like, brought to you by no, no. Here's when like cities like sell their naming rights to companies like, <laughs> like, the, you know, like You've your town that. was called like Gillette Township or something stupid. <laughs> like to, Topeka changed their name to Google for uh for a month to try and get Google Fiber to come there. Exactly, that's weird. Um, so <laughs> it's a bunch of BS. But, but isn't Cooper Tuna okay. basically Appletown? I mean, basically let's be real. I yeah, mean, that's that's fair. <laughs> I don't know, but I guess my point is like that's terrible. But this is a li- at least this like makes sense. Like Kit Kat is candy, and it is the K. So you know, it could be more egregious. I guess is my point. Well, let's break it down because uh, there are two parts to this, and then I'll give my thoughts. Uh, two from parts. The, two parts. Uh, the first yes. part being that um, KitKat is uh, a new mobile operating system. Outside of the name, it's actually an OS. Uh, everyone talked about the name there. You see the little uh, KitKat guy statue. Uh, you also see two of the videos of your face. Mm. And oh, very really? little of the uh, web browser, yeah. <laughs> oh, <Uh-oh, laughs> shoot. Um, what screen did I choose? Hey, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be good. Oh, there we go, there we go. Yeah, but now I can't see it. Difficulties. Well, can you still see you're it? You're using Windows, Sean, let's be real. It's you so complicated. Um, so uh, they announced that the name is going to... I'm just going to turn that off. Uh, you get the idea. So they announced it's going to be called KitKat. That's 4.4, not 5.0, which some people thought it might be. Um, which, you know, makes you question how big of an overhaul it's going to be. Um, Outside of that, we really don't know much about the actual OS itself. There have been rumors that it's going to be tweaked to work across more devices than just phones. There have also been rumors uh, of things including uh, fragmentation and screen resizing area updates, new APIs, new notification widgets, uh, and a new color scheme, but again, those are all rumors. Literally, very little is known about this outside of the name and the fact that it's 4.4. The other big uh, piece of rumor to note is that it may be released. Uh, a rumor date is October 14th, um, but that is just a rumor as well. Uh, Sean, what's yep. the? Uh, I read a thing oh. about how Google. Uh, ripped out a bunch of the stuff that's in the operating system and put it in this app that's distributed through the Play Store. Yep. What is that all about? And so, isn't that also factoring into what how there might not actually be anything really cool because it's all like in the whatever that thing's called, that package that yeah. everyone automatically gets updated without the carrier's input? Yeah, well, that's why they did that. So things like uh, the keyboard is a good example. Um, of uh, features of, that are traditionally built into Android that can then be downloaded. The advantage to this is that not only can things be easily updated through the Play Store, but also it can be installed on devices that are skinned, like Samsung devices and HTC devices. Um, but yes, that I think that really does impact, but I don't know what direction Google wants to go. Do they want to go this full appification route? Um, and I would. Sp- no, I'm not going to disagree, <laughs> but um, you know, what I don't know how that affects their relationships with carriers and with partners because uh, when stuff is locked into the OS, that means stuff can change more easily. And I, I can't imagine manufacturers and uh, carriers are going to be very comfortable with that. I think it's something that's that Google why, would like to do. That's, well, maybe that's why then they have to make this one like really irresistible like with the Kit Kats and some <laughs> maybe killer feature that everyone's like, oh my gosh, I want Google Now to dress me in the morning. And then well, like, Verizon, why won't Google Now dress me in the morning? And part of the rumor, it, it, Google's literal, the only sentence they've put out about this says, quote, it's our goal with Android KitKat to make an amazing Android experience available for everybody. Now, it's vague, but there have been rumors that Google is going to tweak Android, and this plays exactly into that app argument, to work on a wider range of devices, everything from smartwatches to gaming consoles to cheaper smartphones. And when you start removing features and are able to plug and play them in, that goes well to something like a smartwatch that's going to use more of the core operating system with less of the added features like a keyboard, which probably wouldn't be on a smartwatch. So I think that actually plays into it, and I think that's an interesting angle we could see going forward. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that is kind of cool. It's cool, like, I'm sure there's a certain, a certain amount of appeal to that from a developer perspective, because, like, you know, they can work on, on higher level OS features, like, like the keyboard, right? Um, and update those much faster. They can move a lot faster there than they, they can't, could if it was bound to the OS releases, which are, like, you know, what, once a year, once every six months? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's that's an interesting take on it. We'll see. <laughs> now Sean's just gone. No, I'm still here. You just can't see me. Okay. I'm fix. I'm doing my makeup. I'm fixing my hair. Um. Fair so enough. the uh, other part of the story is, of course, the name. And I just want to talk a little bit more. Uh, the Verge has a great article on the, how the name came about. Um, and it's just simply that Google thought it would make a fun name, and they decided to approach. Um. They decided to approach uh, Nestle, who owns the copyright internationally, with the interest. Um. The deal, quote unquote, is that um, they're not going to exchange any money, but KitKat is going to market Android branding on their bars, and are going to give away Nexus Sevens and Google Play gift cards, um, and and, ex- and then Google is going to put their name on their products. Um, so there's no necessarily any uh, money changing hands, but certainly the name uh, is going to be used. Now, cool. my thoughts on this as a marketer. I think Nestle made a mistake. Really? Okay. Yes, I think this was... For Google, I think it's all upside for them. For Nestle, I think it's downside, and here's why. It's an OS that's going to disappear in six months to a year. So for Google, it's not a big deal. It's just a name of an operating system. They're going to get a little flack for saying they sold out, but really, Google's the kind of company they can just play it off as, it's cool, we thought the name would be fun, it's KitKat, you know, Google can get away with that. The Don't problem they have is, this whole narrative about how the executive's favorite thing was KitKat's favorite candy or something like that? Yes, yes, absolutely. The, the head engineer of the Android team uh, absolutely loved KitKat's. Um, it was his avatar for a while on social media. He's always been a fan for a long time, and that was one of the reasons they wanted to do it. Okay. Um, so it's not something that you know Nestle called him, and I totally believe the story. Um, but I think the downside for Nestle is that their name will now forever be associated with this Google operating system. And imagine, I'm not saying this is going to happen. There's some chance this is going to happen, but... This is where the downside comes in. Imagine Android 4.4 sucks. Imagine it bricks phones as they get updated. What is going to be every single headline? KitKat, terrible. KitKat bricks phones. KitKats ruin lives. When you associate your name, you... (laughs) Don't break me off a piece of that KitKat bar. (laughs) Thank you, yes. Give me me a break, exclamation point. KitKat sucks, you know? And that's the problem with a brand... You want to keep as tight of control of it as possible because when you let others do it, you can lose your message very easily. <laughs> and by having letting Google use the name, they're all of a sudden forever associated with this other product that is in no way related to candy. So if I were working at Google, I'd say, yeah, this is fun. Let's do this. If I were working at Nestle, I'd say, thanks but no thanks because I just... I don't see. I don't think it's going to encourage people to buy KitKat or even raise KitKat awareness. Um, <laughs> but the downside is much better than the upside. I, I just. I don't like like raise KitKat awareness. We should, know, we should have like like a walkathon for that. They do it for like like cancer and stuff. Raise KitKat awareness because they're they're tasty. Um, well, and you know this isn't the first time they've done this. I pointed this out because I was talking to someone else about this. The movie. I don't know if you remember uh, the Will Ferrell movie Talladega Nights. Mm. In the movie, his race car is the Wonder Bread car. Wonder yeah. Bread did not pay a dime to have their name used in the movie. The yeah. producers thought it would be funny if Will Ferrell drove the Wonder Bread car because it's white bread and that would be funny. They approached the Wonder Bread folks and said, sure, 
their exposure was some, worth something like $150 million worth of ad money they got for free because the producers wanted it. There was upside to that. But here, I just I don't think the, the upside counteracts the downside, but that's me from a marketing perspective. As far as name goes, I don't care. They can call it I mean, whatever they want. So they call it whatever think, they want, no one will remember it. No, no, and that's true, and I think they were smart going with a series of dessert names. Like, I'll give them credit for that. Uh, I think that's really catchy. Um, so I think, like... I think you're right. It's it's a bit of a gamble. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, but I also don't think it's like. I think the likelihood that this will be this release will be a total disaster is pretty low. Um, you know, it here first. Like, what? I said you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's impossible. Um, but, I mean, Google has a pretty good track record, right? Yeah, and um, like we're talking, you know, this isn't 5.0, this is 4.4. So right, yeah, the that's the other thing, see the some minor kind of, versioning for me. Yeah, so we'll see added features, but we won't see like an iOS 7 type complete overhaul. Right, right. So I think it, it could be, like, fine. But you're think, right. If if it does go wrong, like KitKat has everything to lose, and Google really doesn't. I think if they had, if anyone had paid anybody, this would have been a disaster, a PR disaster. But because it was just Google saying, "Hey, we kind of like the name. You mind if we use it? Yeah, sure. Can we put you on some wrappers? Okay, um, it's fine. I, I don't. It doesn't phase me. You know, it's, it's Google's product. They can call it whatever they want." Yeah. Um, and, and if it makes one more consumer in a store look at a phone and say, is that running KitKat because they heard it somewhere, and it was more memorable than Honeycomb or, you know, mm. ice cream, you know, key lime pie is not memorable. It's long. Um, it's often abbreviated. You know, KitKat's a good name. You know, it could be like... So I know there, there are... I don't know if there are anything more than rumors at this point, but rumors that... They might be trying to sort of reduce the fragmentation across the Android platform. Um, so maybe this is it's part of a greater effort to like kind of raise awareness outside of the name of like just awareness of this software update outside of the usual people who give a crap about what a software update is named. I think um, the, pro the problem with Android software updates is with the carriers. I think if Google could get yeah. the updates to everybody, they would. I think people want the updates. The problem is the carrier in the process of getting uh, an update out and getting it on all these phones. And I think Google is smart by raising the profile mm. of these updates because an informed consumer is a successful consumer. And it's going to be interesting to see if people start calling up and asking why their phone isn't running KitKat. And, and if yeah. that name plays any role in that, because if it does, that's big for Google. Uh, that's what they want. Yeah. No, that's a, I mean, that makes it, like, that makes everybody happier, really, in in theory. Like, it makes people happy because they have the latest software. It makes Google happy because they have the latest software. And it makes the people who write your apps happy because they don't have to f support, you know, fucking Froyo and shit. <laughs> which is like <laughs> totally different <laughs> than the current release. So, you know, it's good for that. You know, that's and obviously that's been one thing that, that Android and I iOS that that really distinguishes iOS from Android is the adoption rate of, of the software. So yeah, it's it's Google knows it's a problem. It's one of their biggest problems with Android, quite frankly. And uh, you know, is is just picking a name going to have any impact? I you know I don't know. I think we'll have to wait and see what the features are and and you know, learn more than that. Indeed. Indeed. All right. Well, with that, uh, I did want to quickly mention that there are rumors. Again, this is in no way official, uh, that the Android 4.4 KitKat release in mid-October is going to be joined by the LG Nexus 5, the next, the next Nexus phone. That's very hard to say. Um, 
We don't know a lot about the phone, but FCC filings have noted that it includes wireless charging, uh, all the LTE bands, uh, which the Nexus 4 does not currently have, NFC, Bluetooth, and all the other good wireless stuff. A uh, four-point, a uh, five-inch uh, screen, hence the Nexus 5 name. Um, outside of that, we don't know much about the phone, but if you're in the market for a Nexus phone, you might want to hold off a little bit uh, before you go buying that. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, sticking with the Android space, we're going to move along to Google Wallet. Uh, Google has been trying uh, extra super hard to be in the payment space, and uh, this may be, could be the single biggest update they've had to Google Wallet since they launched it, and what that does is they uh, click that button and unlocked it on yeah. all carriers, finally. Really? Uh, what was the holdup on this? Was it the carriers or was it Google? It I was, was under the impression it was the carriers. It was the carriers. Yeah. Uh, the specific technical reason, I don't know. Well, I'm sure there wasn't a technical reason. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think there was. It was just it, like... Yeah, no, no it's just it. another app you can install on your phone. It was NFC. Yeah, but the phone... Still, NFC like, to I, use Google Wallet. I, I, Do you? But that's what you previously needed NFC to use it, and now you don't. Yeah, oh, but okay. that, they, like I had a Galaxy Nexus last summer, which has NFC. It just like on Verizon. Yeah, Verizon didn't let Wallet. anyone have Google Wallet. It says here at the same time, Verizon, AT and T, and T Mobile subscribers will finally be able to download the app, though they will not be able to use it to make payments with their phones through NFC technology. Why can't I do? And and that's probably a good thing because NFC is terribly insecure. That's probably one of the reasons why Apple doesn't have NFC. Oh, interesting. Ah, here we go. Now I finally figured out why you couldn't use it on the carriers. Because Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile back the ISIS mobile payment app, which is a Google Wallet competitor. Totally a technical reason. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that was why. So they're, they're opening this up. Uh, you won't be able to do NFC payments, but things you will be able to do include a uh, brand new feature, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, payment, sending money to uh, free to any adult in the U.S. with an email address, uh, similar to what PayPal does. Venmo. Um, Venmo. Venmo. It's mentioned right in this article, Venmo. Um, you will also be able to add loyalty cards just by scanning a barcode or entering in a card number. Um, and that works now without NFC previously. It was NFC only. Nice. Uh, you can now also upload offers through Google Search, Google Offers, and sites, uh, partner sites such as Valpac, those great coupons they still send out in the 21st century, mm -hmm. um, and redeem them by scanning phone at the checkout. So uh, a bunch of new features and open to a lot of new phones. And all devices running 2.3 and up uh, can now have the app. Not NFC payments, but the app. Cool. Yay. So, uh, mobile payment space, hot, competitive, um, and Google's getting out there. Now we just need some place other than Dwayne Reed and McDonald's that support Google Wallet. <laughs> There's a uh, ton out here. Yeah, well, you know what, Colby? And the NFC readers, too. But, Gu mm. Guys, 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 stop this East Coast, West Coast feud. <laughs> all right? This is, it's dangerous. Someone's going to get hurt. Uh, all right, any thoughts on Google Wallet, or are we just announcing the news? I don't know. Why, why, why is Google literally, like, they're sticking their fingers in every single market ever? Like, what haven't they done? It's like payments. There's Google Shopping Express, which is like like Instacart, all that stuff. They have a social network. Like they have the Play Store that does everything. Like, do you really want the answer? I mean, they're trying to take over <laughs> the world. I get it. But... Because because they can, Colby. I know. I what know. would you do if you had unlimited amounts of money? It's just, I don't know. It's it, sort seems, of, it seems like now they're... Uh, yeah, I guess so. You know, it's that old phrase, throw it at the wall and see what sticks, you know? And that's didn't, exactly didn't what... Didn't Larry Page say he was going to stop doing that, though? 
I That's would argue they don't have 20% time and I would argue have... they've slowed down in the last year or two. Yeah, they have. But it seems like with this stuff I guess my beef is that like they're taking other people's good ideas and just th- throwing their resources in it. Like they're not I mean sure the glass and the self-driving car are cool but like this stuff is not they're not first they're just uh, well, neither is Apple, and neither is Microsoft, and uh, you know all these. Neither is Facebook. None of these big companies are ever first. Very rarely. Oh, no, that's true. But like, I guess that. I guess the the real one that, in in my mind, like, like is the the shopping thing. Like, they're they're really just competing with smaller companies on that front, right? Well, no. Coming from a smaller shopping company, uh, you can actually it drives traffic. So they don't sell. Google doesn't sell anything directly. They scrape pages and get listings, and service that through the shopping no, API. No, no, sorry. Google Shopping Express is like. Oh, oh go... the, the yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Totally. Sorry. Yes. The, the, the like shopping home delivery stuff. Right. Okay. Is, I mean. You know, I guess. It just, like, I don't know, it kind of sucks if you're one of these companies that gets, like, trampled by Google. But I guess that's that's life. Hey, on the hey, upside, you might thought, Everyone thought that uh, Facebook check-ins were going to destroy Foursquare. That's true. Foursquare is still around. And on the upside, if, if your product's good enough, these companies will just acquire you. <laughs> no, no big deal. We'll just buy the talent. Instagrams. Speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of buying talent, uh, Google acquires Bump. Uh, have you guys ever used this? No. No, but I have a funny story about this. Okay, go ahead. Um, last last year, when I was when I when I spent my summer in in Palo Alto, um, I was at a, at a party one evening, um, and I was talking to this guy and like. He was pretty nice. We were just talking about random stuff. He was like, he was he was like, you know, a weird West Coast hipster type. He had been like living. He he had just been on Hacker News because he lived out of his car for two months or something. Um. So you know, he was an interesting guy, but he he was like like at at the end of our conversation, he was like, yeah, we should keep in touch. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And he was like, do you use Bump? I was like, no. <laughs> and I guess he did. He was very into Bump. And <laughs> and he was like, well, what do you do if you need to exchange contact info with someone at a party? And I was like, well, usually I just friend them on Facebook or tell them my phone number. <laughs> but, yeah. So so there, I know I met one guy one time that used Bump. But it was in Silicon Valley, so. I mean, this so, company... Account. This company has been around, like, forever. Like, I remember these guys back in, like, 09, and, like... They were, like, like original iPhone or, you know, original App Store style. Yeah. I remember I downloaded Bump on my first iPod Touch, and I was like, this is cool, except I never met new people because I was in high school, so I knew (laughs) everyone I knew. (laughs) But... It's kind of a cool uh, technology, uh, I think, because I'm, I'm reading here. Uh, have we said what this does? Yeah, well, no. Okay, so here's what it does. You have two phones running, each are running bump. And sort of, you know how NFC, you touch them together and it goes, doo, doo, and it sends the data? All right, it's that, but without NFC. You touch them together and it still sends the data. How does that work? This is interesting. I did not know this. I'm just reading this for the first time. The app on your phone uses the phone sensors to literally feel the bump and send it to the cloud. A matching algorithm listens to the bump from all the phones in the world on the service and pairs off the two phones that have the exact same motion. That's awesome. Isn't that insane? That's so legit. Like you have to physically bump them, or like actually move them, you know, physically bump them, and the machine knows which phone you're bumping just by the motion. That's that's super cool. Yeah, I will, I respect that a lot. <laughs> uh, they they have over sixty million users, um, and the company raised just under twenty million dollars total. There's no amount listed as to how much they were purchased for, 
Um, and Google currently has no plans to change them, but you know how that happens. Um, I don't know. I think this is a really, you know, integrating this into Android would really uh, kind of route around that NFC problem. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, for, for, for certainly the sharing feature. Although I could yeah. imagine you could put this... I bet you... Could you put this in, like, a, a, like a still... Like a payment device? Like you tap your phone to it and it knows the motion and you could pay that way? I feel like that's not very secure. Well, as long as you had to confirm it on both ends... Yep. Then I imagine that would maybe be secure... But that is neat. Yeah, I think that's why the the bump it, bump is kind of secure because like you both have to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, and they don't, you know. I mean, obviously the transmission is one thing, but the the data you can send is contacts, photos, you know. At the moment, right. certainly nothing right. crazy confidential. But there's no reason why you couldn't send something crazy confidential. No. No, absolutely not. It, it'll be interesting to see what Google uh, does with it. If it really works that well, that's an interesting uh, algorithm technology that can do that. Yeah. What's next? Bring it on. What's, what is next? Yeah. Uh, we're going we're to move into our stories of the week. Dan and I each have one. Uh, and right. I'm going to jump in and go first, but I promise that we'll do both. Okay. Um, big this week... This week? Big this week... Twitter will become a public company. It files for its IPO. Big news. This like years people have been saying. Years. Uh, currently valued at more than ten billion dollars. Uh, Twitter, uh, we know, has less than a billion dollars. A billion dollars in revenue. I'm a little congested. Sorry. Um, so uh, they uh, announced their IPO, and, and the reason I think this is interesting is because. There's been a lot of back and forth and people arguing, is an IPO the right thing for Twitter to do? And I thought this could be an interesting, uh, you know, round-the-horn panel discussion as to whether we each think um, this is the right decision for Twitter and can they be successful in an IPO? I think Twitter long abandoned its the notion of it being a communications platform when it decided that you couldn't use uh, apps to use like, as a straight-up Twitter client anymore. So, like, if you're going to do that, then sure, become a publicly traded company that is beholden to the stockholders. That's my opinion. Because I think the people who are arguing that Twitter shouldn't IPO is like, oh, it's like a, like a utility, it's like public service, and, you know, it you know facilitates revolutions and blah, blah, blah. But they've already consciously made a decision not to be open, so... Fair enough. That's fair. Um, what about you, Colby? Bring your incredible business acumen to bear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Like, I mean, I know historically they've struggled with with monetizing, right? That's what I've heard. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe they're hoping that. Um, maybe they're they're convinced that they've they figured out what they need to do. You know, like they figured out how to do it right, and that's why like they're looking at IPO now, and then maybe, you know, they'll pick up. They have nowhere to go but up. Uh, if you start a business. And you don't make any money. Isn't what other revenue avenues are there besides advertising? Like, I feel like you can't start charging for the thing you're giving away for free. No, no, you can't. If it was free, you can't stop it. Right. Being free. So once you take that like lean approach of like I'm just gonna make a thing, get tons of users, and figure it out later. Is there yeah. any other strategy besides advertising? Hope you get acquired. Uh, <laughs> that. Yeah. That, Not a good yeah, strategy, but it's a strategy. I mean, it depends what your goals are. If your goal is to make money, then that's a fine strategy. Yeah. I think 
when it comes and the media when I I thought about this, I thought about this for a long time because this was interesting to me, and everyone is putting it up against the Facebook IPO because it is different, but but it is similar in a lot of ways. Well, they have same same sort of business model, right? right? And and Facebook stock luckily has rebounded, but it struggled for a while, and people were concerned. Um, about how it was doing, and people say, "Can is the same thing going to happen with Twitter? Can they succeed on the stock market?" And I thought about it, and I sit all the time in my job in classes studying social media marketing. That's all these people talk about. I'm so sick of it. Hmm. But that's all they like. Social media is going to save advertising. It's crazy. But I will tell you. One of the most telling things to me about a Facebook versus Twitter as far as business and revenue goes and advertising, businesses love Twitter, businesses loathe Facebook. Because on Twitter, they are finding engagement that they're having a tough time getting on Facebook. And that's for a number of reasons. It's how it's set up. It's how even the service itself at its core is designed, but it's also the types of users across services. But I think... The reason people were concerned with Facebook's IPO was revenue. Well, obviously, that's what you worry about when a company goes public. I personally have no worry about Twitter's revenue. I think Twitter is making all the right moves. Everything from sponsored uh, trends to inline sponsored posts, their ads are both effective and non-intrusive. I feel like all the partnerships, acquisitions like Vine are smart. I think this is a company that <laughs> Unlike a Why lot of partnership or an acquisition. What? Was it? I don't think yeah, Vine it was, was a partnership or an acquisition. It was an acquisition. Yeah, they bought Vine. Very oh, oh, really? I thought Vine was just like they're an internal thing they did. No, no it it was in huh. it was in beta. They it bought it before launch. they released Vine though. Yeah. They bought the company once they saw it before it was even released. I see, I see. Okay, that makes sense. And I Sorry. just I feel I don't know. I, it's, hard, it's hard to quantify, but you know, people say, it, it, can Twitter succeed as an IPO? And you know what? I kind of think they can. I think they have a really good handle. They're making a lot of smart, strategic moves. And it's, it's, it's something people are still excited about, which is really rare for a company that's seven years old on the Internet. Yeah, it, it surprises me to hear you say that businesses like Twitter better because it seems like Facebook posts from a page are easily buried and like you don't have to pay attention to the comments whereas on Twitter you'll see like today with Jeff Jarvis's uh, argument with a Verizon support person about whether he get his Nexus 7 tablet on Verizon and they said something stupid and then that tweet now has like 1200 retweets and it's in articles all over the internet. Like, you wouldn't ever see that about a uh, Facebook post. So, like, you are talking before about limiting their uh, brand exposure. Uh, you can delete comments on a Facebook page. Uh, no, it's that's also interesting because conversations are incredibly difficult to follow on Twitter. So it's kind of counterintuitive that people have more conversations or brands have more conversations with their customers on a thing that makes it really hard. But believe it or not, brands hate having conversations. <laughs> I, I believe that. That's why I thought that Facebook would be great, because you just see, like, oh, there's 50,000 comments. I'm never going to look at any of these. But they're I'm so... No, ignore them. but comments on Facebook are so much easier to find than replies on Twitter. So stuff gets buried so quickly on Twitter, whereas on Facebook, people do actually look at all the comments, believe it or not. What? Yes, I've it, tried. Like, sometimes well, I see my friend, like, I'll see it in the news feed, like, oh, someone commented on this post from this company, and I go, there's so many replies, I could never find what they actually said. Well, and that's going to happen on both, but the thing about Facebook is, you know, you like but a, a that single... that doesn't happen on Twitter, because oh. if someone tweets, I can just go to their account and see their tweet, and then double-click on it and expand the conversation that occurred around it. So maybe Twitter is better than I think it is. Yeah, I mean, obviously each has their advantages and their drawbacks, but I just know from people I've talked to in the industry and what I've studied that companies more and more are putting advertising money into Twitter and um, inst um, and Instagram and um, services outside of Facebook because they're not seeing returns like they'd like. 
And I think that's, A, a big selling point for Twitter and an issue for Facebook. But that's, you know, another topic for another day. Um, I, I wish Twitter the best of luck. I hope they make a lot of money. <laughs> All the me money. Too. And they can give me some. Totally. That would be nice. <laughs> um, all right. So unless we have any other thoughts on that, I promised Dan another NSA story. <laughs> Again. Uh, We're never gonna let that go, Sean. It's gonna no, be no. I know. I know. Uh, well, we have a. We, I think we have a fresh conversation. So I don't know if I mentioned this before. I think I did. That it turns out that the NSA has. Uh, so, like people have always talked. There's three ways that we could that encryption could be defeated. Uh, one of the ways is that you break the math, so you find a vulnerability in the math itself that encrypts the things, and that's really hard because like there are some really smart people, including people at the NSA, who have developed these things. Uh, and it turns out that uh, okay, so then you can go after the implementation. So this math is implemented in software in a computer, and that's maybe imperfect. Uh, probably, if it's software, it's imperfect. If it's in hardware, it, it might probably also be imperfect, and then you can kind of exploit that, or you can just deliberately insert yourself into that process and add backdoors, like I think we talked about last time, where the NSA has... Uh, there's evidence to suggest that the NSA has like intercepted packages that are being downloaded from like Linux distributions and replace them with its own versions of encryption that have backdoors transparent to the user. <laughs> Things like that. But turns out that it could even be worse than that and that the NSA has uh, there's a standards body called the NIST, I don't know what it stands for, but they create the standards by which the encryption math is written against and they have, and then Snowden leaked documents that says that they have uh, specifically, like, socially engineered those committees to overlook technical drawbacks of their standards so that the NSA could systematically backdoor any implementation of that at any level they want to, which is pretty crazy. But I guess this is all old news, and we have to assume that the NSA knows everything. Because every time we say, well, at least as long as you encrypt your stuff, you know, then they can't know. Well, they can. Uh, so I don't think there's any, any hope. But the interesting thing about this to me now is there's all this talk about uh, how does this make the tech industry look internationally when there's evidence that Intel chips, the uh, hardware cryptography systems are obvious, you know, very well backdoored. China's not going to buy them now. Russia's not going to buy them. None of these places are going to buy them. Uh, and who knows, like Israel or the UK, who have been shown to be complicit in this, who knows if they knew that this was happening. So there's all sorts of interesting things that are happening here. But it puts the, uh, the whole United States IT cloud, like, come give your business to Google or Amazon or Salesforce. Give us your business contacts. You know, promise we won't do anything with them because they're encrypted in our servers and the U.S. has great privacy laws and freedom and blah, blah, blah. But it turns out that the NSA can look at your customer list, international company, whenever they want to. I mean, uh, so And how does that make, uh, like, confidence in the U.S. as a business and the technology industry as a whole. Yeah, that's uh, like that's one of the things I've said, or at least attempted to articulate since all this NSA BS started. Is like, like we in America enjoys a particularly privileged role in, you know, the tech space and the the inner really just in general the internet in general and all things having to do yeah. with it. It was all developed here. Yeah, and this has like this has serious implications for that. Like, you know, it, 
they've clearly gone too far. I don't. I mean, too far was a long time ago, I think. But like, what do you do now? Like, I don't know. It just. It seems like like shooting ourselves in the foot in more ways than one, and and like they didn't tell anyone about it. So, you know, it feels bad. It feels bad. <laughs> Colby, quote, it feels bad. It does. I don't like it. debacle. It feels bad. I, um, I, well, I have a couple things, but, you know, spying isn't a new concept. Not by a long stretch. The government could tap phone calls around the world decades ago. And it didn't stop people from using the phone. All the computers have done is made spying faster and easier. Now, that's not good, and I'll agree with that. But at the same time, it's not... It, it, I just We all knew the NSA could tap our phones anytime they wanted. That wasn't yeah, but a big the, all the, the, the world's phone networks didn't route through the United States 50 years ago. They do now. Yes. But better for us as Americans. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's not, though. Like, that's... A, and I, I will say, you know, I, you know, the United States is not allowed to buy uh, Huawei, and there's another Chinese company that we cannot buy their phones because the government can't trust them, and they're not sure if they're safe or backdoors for Chinese hackers. Yeah. And it's sort of what we're talking about is sort of the reverse of that. The you, you know, China banning Intel products. Well, I, I guess the thing is like, like. I th- see. I think that's interesting because, you know, I think you ask anyone in America, you tell anyone in America that, right? And they're like, oh yeah, well it's China, of course. They're they're, you know, this oppressive communist government, right? But, you know, the the shoes on the other foot. It's, well, you yeah, know, you know, the people in Norway, uh, up until maybe now, wouldn't have had a problem doing business with the U.S., wouldn't have a problem creating a company that used Amazon EC2. Yeah. I just, it, I, I came up with an analogy as to how I feel about this type of story and the NSA spying. You ready? Ready. The NSA is like the airline industry. Go with me on this. When you take, why do we take airplanes? Because they're faster, they're occasionally more convenient, sometimes they're cheaper, they take us places we can't go otherwise. There are a lot of upside to, to driving in a plane, okay? But for that very small percentage of, of time, one out of every 10,000 people, that plane crashes. We know that going in. It's a known risk. And yet millions of people fly every day because it's such a small percent chance of risk because the upside is much greater. That is how I feel about the NSA spying on everything. But we don't that, know what the upside to the NSA spying okay. is. Obviously, we don't know for sure. I'm going to go to the extremes of this argument, okay? The absolute best-case scenario is that they stop some sort of crazy hacker from busting into our power grid, shutting down electricity across the country, stop them from opening the Hoover Dam and flooding the Grand Canyon, some crazy shit. I don't know. That, that would be the extreme argument here as to what all this spying is doing. Now, if that's true... That is a big upside. They are keeping America safe. But let's do the other extreme. What's the worst thing that could happen here? I'm asking. The worst, the worst thing that could happen. I mean, what's the like, downside to you and me having the NSA spying on us? The worst other, thing that other could than happen our personal is, freedoms, be, like in a practical problem. So I, a the practical worst, problem. Our personal freedoms are not a practical problem. No, that's a theoretical, phil- philosophical problem. I mean like a practical real-life type problem. A practical real-life type implication is that the government has this stuff, and if Edward Snowden could get it, then the FBI could get it, and then all of a sudden you're being, your evidence is being used against you that was collected semi-illegally uh, for a crime that wasn't a crime maybe at the time, but now 20 years later it is, and they have this backlog of every everything we do is online, all the stuff we buy, who we talk to, and all of a sudden you can imagine a McCarthyist-like situation where he's like, well, 
on January 10th, 2012, we, you had this conversation with Sean Jennings, and you indicated that you supported his idealistic state, and, you know, now he's a terrorist. Uh, so, you know, do you have any way to defend yourself? And like, nope, and, all right, you're going to prison. That's the worst thing that could happen. Wow, you did take that to the logical extreme. <laughs> Is it? I don't know if it's that extreme, though. No, I. You know? That come on, I'm really not buying that. My extreme would have been something like a false imprisonment, or and my argument was going to be that it happened such a small percentage of the time. Like air travel, it's an acceptable. Well, McCarthyism risk. happened. Yeah, but I would like to think it wouldn't happen again. Well. I'm I'm optimistic. Anyway, <laughs> I still think my my analogy stands, and that the odds of me personally getting arrested and getting in trouble for things I've you know for things the NFA, NSA has spied on me about, um, especially in the age of the internet, I don't think McCarthyism could get away with it. But that's a whole other conversation. I'm just saying, such a small, small, tiny percent chance of risk, I'm willing to go for the upside. I'm willing to roll the dice. I think, I, I think I think you're in the majority here, but I also think like that 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 majority is representative of like a general complacency in in our amongst our 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 populace that is I don't know it doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence in where we're <laughs> headed. I think yeah. one possible upside, though, is that we could generate technical solutions to this problem, which That's would be true. pretty cool. Yeah. There's a couple proposals that would prevent these sorts of man-in-the-middle attacks that are, you know... There's nothing you can do to prevent standards bodies from being infiltrated by the NSA and, uh, you know, surreptitiously influenced to do things the wrong way. But there is, you know... You can't just log you if you you know broke into Google servers and you got their key, they couldn't decrypt your email because they have to have something. You know, I think there are good things that can come out of this that would be pretty cool that would maybe help circumvent this problem, and then we'd all be happy, except the NSA. Regardless of what side you're on, we should always be paying attention. Indeed, I think that's a good takeaway message. Either that, or, or I don't know why the NSA just doesn't do like an IBM and just do server technologies for. All the companies around the world. That's what they're doing anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's fair. Make some money back on that. Uh, all right. Well, uh, awesome. Outstanding conversations, as usual. Uh, and we're going to move on to uh, the picks this week. And you guys both have just, like, such outstanding picks. Um, I need to get a life because your picks are just outstanding. I have never great seen. They're good. So yeah. uh, so who's going who's gonna to jump on the bandwagon and volunteer to go first? I'll, I'll go, go first. Ah, Whoa! I like this. Uh -huh. I don't really care. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so pursuant to our conversation about what, Colby, what was that thing you mentioned? What? The Google Express Shopping oh, Google Hangout. Express. Yeah. Google Shopping Express. Right. So there's this other cool thing called Quinciple, which is only in Manhattan and Brooklyn. But there's other things like this. There's Farmago... Uh, what's the San Francisco one called, Colby? Uh, the, the grocery... Yeah, where they, like, just bring you a box of pre-picked food, you don't have to think oh, about it. Oh, that one? I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, there's, like, one in Chicago, so, you know, if you're in one of these metropolitan areas, you check this out. Anyways, there's one in New York called Quinciple. Basically what they do is they pick out these foods for you for the week, <laughs> and you pay a fee, and you get it delivered every week. Uh, so, like, we can look at this week, and if I became a member by Friday, which I will, I'll get this box. It has Acadian redfish, cherry tomatoes, squash, eggs, garlic, ginger, mustard greens, peaches, sourdough, basil, honey, and then they give you recipes that use these ingredients down here and cooking tips and cool things like that which is pretty awesome. So you get the benefit of eating out in that you don't have to think about what you're eating and also maybe that you're delegating the healthiness of that thing to someone else. But you also get the benefit of, I'm not sure if you're necessarily saving money. I think you probably are because it's $37 for a week's worth of food, uh, three meals, or, you know, 37 divided by 10, 
five dollars a day for like lunch and dinner or breakfast and dinner. That's pretty good. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, and also you get to like you know learn how to make food, which some of us may or may not be awesome at. Uh, you don't have to worry about like oh, I have to go to the grocery store and well before I go to the grocery store I have to think about what I'm going to make this week. But I can't really think about what I'm going to make this week until I go to the grocery store to see what they have and I see what's in season and blah blah blah. So it's very lazy and I approve. That's quinciple.com. That is super cool, and I love the fact that they rotate stuff in and out every week. Yeah, see, and it's all locally sourced. Yeah, and I'm looking on there. If you go to uh, quinciple.com, uh, they have the list of all the uh, farms and producers they work with, and you can do research on them, and there are some from up here in the Hudson Valley. There's uh, yeah, I don't know if you know, farms Narragansett is a big one. Creamery in Rhode Island. Um, Narragansett. Yeah, Narragansett Creamery, so stuff from all over the New England and the Northeast. So um, that's super cool. I'm jealous that it's uh, it's in uh, Brooklyn, but I will say that there are um, – anyone out there watching, uh, I recommend uh, talk to local people in your area because there are a lot uh, now. This is a new thing. There are a lot of – they don't have fancy websites and everything, but there are a lot of uh, farms now that uh, do co-ops and things where they'll give you X amount of food for X amount of dollars every single week. Um, you know, it's not as convenient, but it's like a new age co-op. Yeah, um, my, our our mutual friend Joe upstairs uh, just got a big box of all fresh organic uh, vegetables um, oh. from a co-op, and they looked beautiful. So, uh, if you're in Brooklyn, try this out. But if not, check in your local area. Cool. Uh, Quincipole. That's right. mine. That is that is Dan's. Cool. Uh. Colby, you want to go, or you want me to go? Sure, I'll do it. Blow us um, away. So my my setup for my pick this week is like a double story. Whoa. Um, so so the first slow part down is, there. <laughs> I know, I know. Get ready. Um, the first part of this story is that I have recently became a real person in that like I have a job. And I pay my rent, and um, I what else do I do? I pay taxes and um, you have doctor's appointments. There's another thing. There's something else. No, oh, utilities, water, utilities. water. That that was the the crazy one. Oh my gosh. Um, and also like like I have to set up like a 401k and stuff, and I literally like. I don't know anything about being a real person. I just came from Marist College. <laughs> you know, like, I didn't have to pay for water there. They just shipped it right to my, my like, Spigot. crappy, crappy cookie-cutter dorm room. And, you know, my life was pretty easy. And I don't know anything about this stuff. Um, so there's that, right? I, I, <laughs> I, I have a certain certain amount of ignorance that I'm trying to overcome at this point in my life. <laughs> um, so the other day, I, I was on the, on the shuttle home from work, and I was checking my email, and I had like 6 million recruiter emails on LinkedIn. And by 6 million, I mean like 4, but like a non-trivial amount of recruiter emails. Um, and I like... I like to reply to them. I don't know why. I just feel rude just ignoring them. So I, I, I usually reply. And I was looking through, and one was for some company called Nerd Wallet. Um, so I took a look. Basically what it is, it's a bunch of, like, just documents, like articles and tools to help you figure out your finances. So they have all kinds of res Well, I can put here. Um... Sweet. So they have all, they have all kinds of resources from uh, picking a credit card, picking a checking account or a savings account, um, to dealing with like student loans and like coupons. I have any Etsy coupon? What? Oh. Hmm. Someone has a pretty awesome marketing team. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that! I can get awesome. gloves for ten percent off. 
<laughs> so apparently they, they do Etsy coupons if you're into Etsy, which I, I think at least one of us. <laughs> I, I suspect probably two. <laughs> But yeah, they they have all kinds of stuff. There's like, uh, what I was just looking at one that was cool. Like if you were looking for mutual funds, they have they have these recommended funds like best index funds. I don't even know what that means, but but if I wanted to know what it meant, I'm sure I could find out pretty quickly with with the help wallet. Um, mm-hmm. So if if like if like me you're trying to go overcome a certain degree of like I don't know ignorance <laughs> lack of education yes lack of education so, yeah they don't teach this stuff in colleges and they don't teach it in high school anymore like they still have shop class but they don't have like how to you know whatever the balance your checkbook like right. anyone well, has I mean, books anymore. To be fair, but... is not a thing that you have to do anymore. Right. Um, but like, <laughs> like you're right. Like practical, like real life stuff. Like you get thrown into the, into this, and you're totally on your own. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, check it out. It's it's been. I I haven't gotten into it too deeply yet, but it's been cool. What I from what I've seen of it, it seems like useful. Like. Relatively easy to digest information uh, for for ignorant young folk like me. So, <laughs> give it a look. All right, nerdwallet.com. All the tools in one place for you fine folks. That's uh, that's definitely a bookmarker. Right there. Okay. Um, I could not come up with a good tech pick this week. Because I don't live in, like, tech central like you guys. Uh, I live up here in the middle of nowhere. And I ask people, I, I do, believe it or not, before the show, I always ask people, like, oh, you got any new apps or any new websites you're using? And they're like, have you talked about, you know, LinkedIn? You know, and I'm like, yeah, people have heard of that, you know. It's like, there's uh-huh. Google Maps. It's really great. <laughs> um, so I couldn't come up with an app pick this week. But I thought, outside of just tech, what was awesome this week? And Sunday night was awesome. And if you want to know why, it's because there was the season two of The Newsroom had their finale. And lended to my uh, hypothesis that Aaron Sorkin is a goddamn genius. And you should love everything he does. Let me explain why. Aaron Sorkin is a television and movie writer who's had a long career uh, and has done a number of projects. And everything he's done has been outstanding, except for a few exceptions, but we'll just say everything was great. You may know movies of his, like uh, The Social Network and Moneyball are some of his more current ones. But I want to talk specifically about his television work, which I think is some of the most outstanding television ever produced in the history of television. Yes. Sorry. As I was saying. Um, So, I am going to... um, break down Aaron Sorkin's career into three shows that you need to stop whatever you're doing and go watch. I mean that. Just drop whatever you're doing, go watch it. I'm ready. Okay. The first is... I gotta... This is... The first is Sports Night. Okay? Mm -hmm. It was his first television show, half-hour comedy set backstage at a uh, sports television show kind of like ESPN. It is an outstanding... Each half hour is excellent. Peter Caruse, Felicity Huffman. Uh, that's actually where she met William H. Macy, her future husband. This show is absolutely outstanding. Um, and it's an easy half hour show, a great way to get into sort of the Aaron Sorkin mindset. It ran for two seasons back in 98. You can stream it for free on Amazon Prime. And I may actually go rewatch it because I enjoyed it so much. His second foray, and is possibly uh, best known is, of course, The West Wing. The Mm. West Wing, in my opinion, is probably the show I would rate highest quality that I've ever seen. The writing is solid, the plot is great, and it's a fun show to just sit and watch and enjoy. 
It ran for seven seasons, but the last two were useless, so don't watch them. Because uh, Aaron, Aaron, Sor- Aaron Sorkin quit, and they brought in all new people, and it was awful. So just the first five. Uh, and that is currently streaming for free on both Netflix and Amazon Prime. So add it to your queue. Sit and watch it. It sounds intimidating, but it's a quick show to get through, um, and the drama is excellent. And, of course, uh, none would be complete without mentioning The Newsroom, uh, which currently just finished its second season on HBO. Uh, and you can get the first season for purchase on Amazon and iTunes, and you can stream both seasons on HBO Go if you're a subscriber. I know I threw a lot out there, but I'm just going to say, Aaron Sorkin, if you want to know what good television is, go watch Sports Night on Amazon, The West Wing on Netflix, and The Newsroom on HBO. He, Done. he also That's it. in CIS, right? <laughs> he knows better. He knows better. He's a smart guy. <laughs> and he's, he's writing the Steve Jobs movie. That's actually based on the book, not the Ashton Kutcher crappy one. <laughs> there That's are two? Project. Yeah, that. yeah. The, 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 uh, his is the one officially licensed from the Isaacson book. I see. Um, so that is uh, my pick this week, Aaron Sorkin. Television genius. Um, good stuff to add to your various cues, watch lists, lists, etc., etc., etc. Woo! I am winded. I'm exhausted. Maybe I'll, I'll check that out after I finish Orange is the New Black. Oh, that's a good show, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have to start that. I, I've, been, I've been taking it real slow, like <laughs> one, one episode every couple days, and it, it feels good. Like It's very chock it full, so you can do that. To not binge on, <laughs> mm-hmm. on, I on a TV show for once. Also, I recently discovered... So this past weekend when I, I w- went to Seattle, I took... Um, uh, Virgin, and they have TVs in the seats, like, and you can watch, like, cable television on the plane, and I realized that I hadn't watched TV, like, real broadcast television with, like, those commercial things in it. I hadn't watched that in, I don't know, two or three months, and going back to it was, like, viscerally upsetting, like, it feels so bad. <laughs> it's just horrible. It it's oh my god! I can't believe we did that for so long, and I will ne- I will never watch TV again if I can avoid it. Probably for sports. That's the only thing. But yeah, high five. Putting yes. us advertisers out of a job. I'm sorry, man. Explore hey, Twitter's the future. You know, <laughs> just tweet at me, bro. Yeah. What an excellent callback. <laughs> I also haven't been on Twitter in a month. So, ooh, ooh. But I did oh. see everything that happened on Facebook. I was going to say, Cole, but you never go on Facebook. No. Never. He's never online. I don't understand. I see everything. <laughs> uh, all right. Wow. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of this fantastic episode, our 14th of uh, Don't Panic. Uh, I want to remind, first of all, thank you to all of our live listeners for joining us this evening. Uh, and those of you who couldn't be with us live, of course, it is always available after the fact, audio and video, at don'tpanic.io. And please, I beg of you, uh, like us, uh, because if you do that, you're going to get not only we're going to remind you day of when we're live, we're going to tell you when we're live, we're going to tell you when the new episode is out. It's great, and we won't harass you, um, and we want your interaction regardless of what I said about Facebook. You should like us anyway. Facebook.com slash show. Uh, on behalf of Dan, Colby, and myself, I want to thank everyone out there for watching, and I'll end the show as we often do by reminding everybody, take a deep breath, relax, don't panic. We will be back next week with all the tech news you can handle, but until then, good night.